You are listening to When Therapists Watch TV, where we discuss today's buzzworthy TV shows and what they can teach us about ourselves, our relationships, and the world around us. I'm your host, Dr. Terry Bly, licensed clinical psychologist at LA Mental Health. Ted Lasso is a show about a lot of things, but at its heart, I think Ted Lasso is a show about men and masculinity and what it means to be a man and maybe what our expectations what our expectations are of men that are potentially problematic. I also think Ted Lasso offers some ideas about how we could help men develop a healthier sense of themselves and still have that confidence and all the things that we love about men. And just to discuss that, I brought in a couple of men uh, I have with me, <laughs> two therapists. They're two men, which means they know everything there is to know about men and masculinity. So here I have Austin and Austin Jacobson and Kyle Ross, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves, uh, and then we'll talk more about what this show is going to cover. So, hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Yeah. Hi, I am Austin Jacobson, um, MA for those of you who might care about such things. I have been working in the mental health field for about a decade now, give or take a little bit more. Um, I also have a history in theater and other things like that. I did not know that about yeah. you. We will discuss that later. Yeah, more of the technical okay. side. But, um, but then I also grew up in a very um, conservative and traditional household. Um, and did a lot of stuff in like shops and, and workshops and stuff like that growing up. So kind of a duality there. Nice. Um, yeah, there's probably more, but we'll leave it at that. I do want to just make a quick plug that you head up our virtual reality therapy yes. program, yes. which is amazing. And we're going to talk about that in a different format, but I just think that's a very cool thing that you're yeah. doing. Thank here. you for the plug. So. <laughs> uh, hi, Kyle. Hi, um, Kyle Ross. Uh, I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. Um, I've been at LA since the beginning, and currently uh, I oversee Intero Psychedelic Therapy. Um, psychedelics have been a really important part of my life through, well, a lot of my life, and the main thing that I clinically focus on now. Um, I grew up in a very, very blue collar, like somewhat traditional gender role family. But I think the thing that makes me really interested in this conversation is um, my specific family was very, uh, my mom was the matriarch of the family. So my mom made a lot more of the decisions. And I think that that in a really positive way has shaped a lot of how I think about healthy, healthy masculinity. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here and talk through this. All right, well, I'm, I'm excited to get going with this. So you've both watched Ted Lasso. Mm -hmm. um, I know you both like the show, mm -hmm. is that correct? Oh, yes, yeah. it's great. Yeah. So I guess I wanted to start with kind of a, more, a broader question, then we can drill down into, into specific characters and scenes, situations. But I wanted to get your sense of, you know, what were your initial impressions of the show um, when you first watched it, in terms of how the male characters are portrayed, like, were you were you happy, excited? Were you surprised? Was there anything that stood out to you about? I mean, this is a show with the vast majority of the characters are men, and they really do a lot of. I mean, they sh they're very different men mm -hmm. <laughs> in this show, and so I was just wondering, when you watched it, did you have any sense of like, oh, this is interesting what they're doing here? Very much so. Um, I mean, even in some of the first scenes in episode one where we're meeting Ted Lasso himself and meeting Coach Beard um, and meeting the rest of the team, you already get to have like a sense of the depth and complexity of each character. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously Ted Lasso being the namesake of the show and when he's front and center, he immediately shatters a lot of the stereotypes of masculinity, especially mm -hmm. in a sports arena. Right, right, which is a good point. Not only is the show mostly men, but it's male athletes and professionals who work with mm -hmm. male athletes, which one could argue would normally be like where you'd see the most like male, typical mm -hmm. man mm -hmm. sort of characters. Exactly. Kyle, what, what did you think? Like I was thinking about the difference between season one and season two where like I think watching the first season like my wife and I watched all of it probably in one night and I 
absolutely loved it. And I think like had that idea of like Ted Lasso being a very Mr. Rogers-esque mm -hmm. type person, which anyone who knows me knows I love Mr. Rogers. <laughs> but what I thought was interesting as it goes on, you can start to see that the way that he remains this like overly positive person mm -hmm. actually isn't working for mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not entirely sure that he even realizes that. Mm -hmm. He really helps mm -hmm. a lot of these men start to break out of their kind of their the, their traps of of gender expectations mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. and you know not being able to talk about their feelings or not feeling safe to being vulnerable and he really mm -hmm. is the catalyst for all of that while also being trapped mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. his own mask and feeling yeah. like he can't be his real self mm -hmm. um, because it would mean facing you know right. some of his own really intense feelings. Well that was actually a conversation I was having with someone just today around how Historically, at least in Western culture and society, men are often taught, you know, you get two emotions, happy mm -hmm. and angry. Yeah. Right. And that's right. it. Yeah. So what do you do with anything else? You know, maybe you don't have the language for it, or maybe you don't actually know how to um, describe what you're experiencing. So it has to mm -hmm. come out as one of those two things. Oh, I love that. Because it just occurred to me, like, in, is it season two, I think? So Ted's, you know, always happy, always positive, and then mm -hmm. he's got that alter ego yeah. that yeah. comes out mm -hmm. who's angry. Yep. So really, those are the only two emotions that we see from him mm -hmm. until he has kind of his, you know, breakthrough, breakdown, right. whatever you want to call it, with Dr. Sharon, mm -hmm. that yeah. he's either happy or he's angry, and I yeah. never thought of it through that framework. Well, and I think, like, even the parts where, like, the panic attack or, like, the anxiety mm -hmm. that he starts to feel, like, it makes me wonder if there weren't words to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And then it comes out almost physically. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like he didn't know how to express the stuff. And so no. his body mm -hmm. was just right. going to react, get right. out there. Yeah. yeah. Well, so often, I mean, you know this as well as I do, um, especially older men who experience a panic attack for the first time will often go to the hospital thinking that they're mm -hmm. having a heart yeah. attack. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where like Kyle's saying, like it comes out in that very physical way and they mm -hmm. don't actually know what's mm -hmm. going on. And of course, you know, you can only be happy or angry. Mm -hmm. So this can't be fear. This can't be anxiety. It has to be something physical. Well, okay, I'm having a panic or a, a heart attack. I got to go to the hospital yeah. and nope, it's panic. Well, I almost wonder if they would prefer that it is a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> like, easier. Like <laughs> it's, it's like funny, but it's also well. like yeah. on a serious part, yeah. like I think you know, different generations, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. there's differences where like I think we're this age and I think it's far more socially acceptable to have emotions mm -hmm. and especially within our field, but like, you know, previous generations, like I almost wonder if they would interpret mm -hmm. that as incredibly weak where like right. a, a heart attack would mm -hmm. be preferable mm -hmm. to mental well, issues. Well, it goes into that it's all in your head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. like if it's, if it's a panic attack, well, then that means it's all in my head or something. It mm -hmm. isn't real. And so then what am I even, am I going crazy? Am I like, because right. again, without those words or permission to feel mm -hmm. other things than happy right. or angry, then yeah. And then you throw on more cultural stuff on top of that, like Ted Lasso being from the South where yeah. there's that culture and then mm -hmm. them being in the UK where stoicism is yeah. prevalent. Yeah. It just, and, enforces these concepts even more. Yeah. No, I like that. I like thinking through that lens of if men are only able to be happy and angry, then what is it that we see with the different characters in the show as mm -hmm. they're evolving? And really what mm -hmm. we're seeing yeah. is they're starting to express other feelings and mm -hmm. then what happens when they're allowed to do that. Right. Well, and I think even happy and angry, like I almost wonder if happy isn't the word because I mm. think there's almost like a it's more like a that's the way things are. Mm. Like I don't even know that it's happy. Happy. Yeah, like it's a just neutral yeah. Or, yeah. Like Sto it's is it more back to that stoic kind of like maybe. is it? Do you think men that there's kind of a message that happy is not like is that too showy? Is that because Ted is Ted's definitely like bringing the happy. Mm -hmm. There must be. I think there. I'm not entirely sure how to articulate it, but I would think from that lens, he would just be seen as strange. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Right. Like it's atypical, which mm-hmm. I, I yeah. know that's why we're having this conversation, but like I don't know that it would be happy. I think it's just, I think neutral is almost more yeah. the thing from like, because I think we both kind of grew up in like blue collar backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Like I don't think it's happy. My dad worked in a factory for 30 mm-hmm. years and they had a thing where I got to work in the factory while I was in college. It was like a way to like pay for things, but it was really, there was a lot of guys in their 50s, 60s that like older generation, very blue collar. And like, I don't think ha- they would never describe a state of being as happy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's like the way that it is. Mm-hmm. Like things are working. It would almost be like pragmatic conversations mm-hmm. that I think like you and I would say like, well, things are working really well. Like I right. feel happy or mm-hmm. content or, yeah. You know, there's probably 10 more words that we would have for it. Mm. But I think from that mindset, it's things are, that's just happening the way that it should be. Like things are fine. Yeah, fine. Fine Fine. is a great word. Fine, yes, right. So if I'm gonna, I'm gonna now kind of, if it's all right, feel free to like interject or bring up other things. But I wanted Mm -hmm. to drill down a little bit into what I saw in Mm -hmm. the show as I was thinking about it through this concept of masculinity and to me, one of the things that I think the show really starts to um, bring home or try to advocate for is the need for men to connect with other men. Mm. We like so many men that I know, their one close connection, maybe they have like one friend from like fifth grade that they've stayed friends forever, but then it's their female partner. Mm-hmm. For We're talking about heterosexual men. I should mm-hmm. mention that I think this show really talks about kind of heterosexual men and the expectations nice. of them. But one thing that I really, I was really pleased with was the the scenes that show men connecting with other men. Like I'm thinking Mm -hmm. of, I mean, it starts with Ted and Beard, right? Mm -hmm. They come in, they've got this very close relationship. Then they create the diamond dogs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I just think there's something very beautiful about the message that sends. So I wanted to Mm -hmm. ask you guys, you know, what did you think of of that theme? Did, Did you notice that in the show? And also, you know, and what did you think mm-hmm. about how that was portrayed in terms of men connecting with other men on different, mm. on different levels other than just teammates or whatever? Right. And then what do you think it makes it so hard for men to create these stronger social connections? Because we know that like mm-hmm. when, there's, when a man uh, gets divorced or he's widowed, that he suffers a lot because of that lack of broader connection and that, we, that men really would benefit from this. So I just want to get mm-hmm. your thoughts on that. I honestly, I think the the idea of like the diamond dogs and whatnot. What, the first time that I saw that, and they all kind of like mm-hmm. came together, like rolled over in their chairs and whatnot. I thought it was beautiful and mm-hmm. wonderful, and it is not something that you see yeah. a whole lot. Um, kind of in the same thing of like you know we are often taught that things are fine or be angry. We aren't taught how to really have those deeper emotional connections, especially with other men. Mm-hmm. So it kind of becomes this like perpetuating cycle um, where especially in like more blue collar communities or more traditional communities, what your what male friendships really might look like is, hey, let's go grab a beer, let's go and mm-hmm. watch the game, and that's it. Right. Um, Find ways to not talk. Right. We'll play a sport. It's yeah. doing yeah. something. Yes, yeah. we'll do something. We won't just sit and talk about our relationships and get advice right. from each other, which is what I love about the Diamond Dogs. Yeah. Is usually yeah. they're talking about relationships and you know bouncing ideas or questions mm-hmm. or frustrations off each other and getting advice, which mm-hmm. is, yeah. and they do it in a way that I think doesn't compromise who they are as men. They don't seem no, they're not very masculine as they're right. doing it. They're they're very confident yeah. in who they are. Um, which that's probably a whole other thing that yeah. we can talk about is a lack of confidence or kind of that, that lack of like self-identity and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it, just going and bring this up, it actually brought me like a quick memory to, um, I was hanging out with some friends over the weekend and talk about like breaking gender stereotypes and gender roles. Me and my uh, male friend Alex, we were in the kitchen actually making like homemade pasta and whatnot and talking about our relationships. Yeah. And like had this moment where you know we're we're doing these things, and then some other friends came over. We were at a birthday party. And it was a couple of guys, and just back to that like traditional male way of doing things. It was it was jarring. So, hmm. to my mind, it really isn't something that you see often. 
Um, I think it's becoming more accepted, I guess, as men are becoming mm -hmm. more aware of their own emotions and vulnerabilities and um, how good it actually feels to have that connection. So you think that there are, there is a bit of a movement in this direction mm -hmm. that maybe what Ted Lasso is showing isn't novel, isn't like, futuristic science fiction, yeah. but it's actually like, this is where maybe society is starting to mm -hmm. tiptoe into. Yeah. You've noticed that as well, Kyle? Yeah. Like, and it, I think there's like generational things, but like I would say our age group, like I don't think it's novel. I think that's mm -hmm. far more common than what it once was. Mm -hmm. And like, I was thinking about the idea that I don't think it's just good that men have that. I think it actually is becoming critical. Mm -hmm. I think it's always been critical, and it just hasn't happened for a lot of men. I think men have suffered for I ever. Mm -hmm. for I agree. Like I, I like I would agree with that. I think that there has been a shift mm -hmm. that like it's becoming critical that like people want partners that understand how to have a conversation about difficult mm -hmm. things. And I think that uh, as time goes on, I think it will become more and more crucial. Otherwise, I think men that stay in that isolated, very kind of toxic masculinity thing, I think are not going to be desirable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. it, it, that's just not going to be accepted anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'd agree with you, it was always critical, yeah. but I think the societal kind of constructs still allowed for that to continue, whereas now I would say like that is massively shifting. Mm -hmm. Which is, that's, that brings me to something that I've observed in, in my own kind of adult life and professional careers that I think where we are at in society, I find a lot of women who leave their marriages because they're upset with their husbands for not being more, mm -hmm. you know, emotionally intelligent, for not knowing how to talk about, you know, feelings and go to scary places and connect on that level. And I felt really, I have to say, I felt really bad for the men because at least, you know, when I was growing up, I'm a little older than you guys, and I think guys still weren't encouraged to talk about their feelings. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, on the playground, that kind of stereotype yeah. that I think to some extent is true, is like if girls get into a fight at school, they're kind of ushered into the counselor's office and they t like talk through their problems mm -hmm. and they're encouraged to like, you know, come to an understanding and make up and mm -hmm. be friends. Mm -hmm. And guys, are, are boys, I think for a lot of, I don't know if they are now, but I know when I was growing up, I don't think there was any expectation that guys were gonna sort through their disagreements in a constructive mm -hmm. way that brings them closer. I don't think there was a lot of that happening. And mm -hmm. so I felt bad for these, for these men who were never taught growing up how to connect emotionally, how to be vulnerable, how to talk about their feelings, how to go to other people to ask, hey, what do I do about this relationship thing? Can you help me? Mm -hmm. And then they're in a marriage with somebody who's expecting them to have those skills that nobody mm -hmm. ever taught them. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. it's just, it just does men such a disservice to, to then be kind of blamed for not having the skills that mm -hmm. nobody's taught them. And I do think a lot of the characters in the yeah. show, like Roy, for example, oh. <laughs> is such a prime example. Yeah. Like he's a good guy, but no, obviously never mm -hmm. was given the opportunity <laughs> to, to, to express feelings and to mm -hmm. be sensitive and to show emotions. And so, you know, as he's trying to figure out how to do that, you can see how awkward it is mm -hmm. for him to try to make that shift. Yeah. But I think that's why he's probably I would argue one of the most endearing people mm -hmm. on the show, even more than Ted Lasso. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, because I think, I don't know what you would say, Austin, but like, I think thinking back on watching it, like if I had to pick a favorite character, it would be him. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, think it's, it's because you kind of watch the, a thing that you and I have probably gone through parts of. Mm -hmm. Like you grew up in a culture where like, you just don't talk about feelings, yet, we're therapists, so like at some point we had to make a transition to be like, mm -hmm. this thing over here doesn't work. Right. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. I've seen how it doesn't work. But I think there is that kind of awkwardness and kind of trying to figure that out that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think he, his storyline, I think addresses so many things, like including just his identity being caught up in being, you know, in his job of, mm -hmm. you know, star athlete and then watching what happens as that starts to go away. 
and he's faced with like, if I'm not an athlete, who am I? I think, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of men aren't professional athletes, but I think they very much connect with that piece of if, if my identity mm -hmm. isn't my career, then who am I? Right. And then trying yeah. to, then finding someone they want to be in a relationship with, but mm -hmm. bumping up against that, like, I don't know how to, I don't know how mm -hmm. to connect like this. I don't know how to be vulnerable. Right. I mean, we see that actually in like uh, suicide rates where one of the highest like age groups for um, mm. attempting suicide and dying by suicide are men post-retirement. Because, you know, their sense of purpose and meaning is so wrapped mm -hmm. up in what they do for a living that suddenly they don't have that anymore. And Especially if, divorced men in that age yes. group. Yes, yeah. yep. Like, yeah. Well, and I think for Roy though too, his is even slightly more complicated because mm -hmm. it's not just being an athlete. He was the best athlete. Yeah, yeah. he was a star athlete. He mm -hmm. was the And as he ages, you could still be an athlete maybe, but even that's going away. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's like there's multiple layers of mm -hmm. what that process yeah. is for him. Yeah. That makes it a little bit different. It makes it different, but I also think it makes it relatable. Absolutely. And, and that yeah. idea of who, if I'm not my career, who am I? Mm -hmm. If I can't do this thing that I've been known for, praised for, rewarded for, loved for, mm -hmm. then what happens to me? Right. And he really is kind of like a shining example of that like mentality of everything's fine or I'm angry. Cause like yeah. whenever he feels yeah. anything besides yeah. those things, he goes to anger. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, later on, he <laughs> eventually starts to halfway be able to express how he's feeling and whatnot. Yeah. But it's certainly a challenge for him. Well, and his anger was a strength. Yeah. I mean, that's what people loved about him. They mm -hmm. encouraged him. Mm -hmm. Like you lost yeah. your anger, where to go, get it back and go out there and do what you do. Yeah. Like he was, he was, explicitly rewarded mm -hmm. for having that emotion and not for being other things, not right. for, you know, evolving beyond that. Mm -hmm. I think didn't serve him well from what we've seen at least yeah. in the show. I think there's something about like societal pressures too, because like if you go back a couple generations, at least like I'm thinking of the US because I understand that better, but like two generations back, one income household. Mm -hmm. So like, role, like the more traditional gender roles were very clearly defined. Like as a male, you find a job, you make money, you provide for your family, mm -hmm. you can be fine or angry. And really the requirements in there, like you, that's what you do. Like mm -hmm. there weren't mm -hmm. expectations of being highly involved in your kid's life and teaching them things, mm -hmm. whatever. And I think that that is massively shifting. Like. Yeah. Most people I know have two income households. Like people have, like there's just more complexity mm -hmm. that exists now than maybe 70 years ago. I would add to that though, just to play devil's advocate, I know a lot of families where if the man makes a lot of money, then it is assumed that the woman will stop her career to, <laughs> mm -hmm. to take care of the kids because she doesn't have to work is what I heard all the time. Yeah. You know, when I was, when my kids were young, my husband yeah. had a good mm -hmm. job, I would hear like, well, so, but you don't have to work then, right? And so it was like this challenge of like, anyway, but what that meant for, for the men and for my husband at the time and what I hear in a lot of men is there, they are, there's more expectation that they're gonna be involved in their kids' lives, but then if they're also the primary breadwinner, then that's like now again, there's all these expectations of them that I don't feel like they were necessarily well prepared for mm -hmm. to, to do all of those yeah. things. And they might want to, they, they want, I think men genuinely wanna be more involved in their kids' lives but still have this holdover expectation that first and foremost, they need to be good at their jobs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. And then, yay, you can also be a great dad. Isn't that amazing? Like yeah. now you're a superhero, but I still think like stay-at-home dads, for example, I yeah. still feel like mm -hmm. we haven't fully embraced that idea. I was gonna say, I don't know that that's done yet. Cause like, I don't yeah. know what you think Austin, but like, I still think that they're like, even though I would put myself in like trying to be very aware of my emotions and like mm -hmm. want to be involved in my kid's life, all like all of that stuff. Like I still think that there is, I still feel that there is a pressure to be really good at your job so you can do the other mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. It's not, they're not equal right. or not quite equal yet. So I, I definitely agree mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm bouncing around a little bit, but something that I hadn't thought of till just now, since we're talking about this, you know, in, in the first episode of this podcast, we talked about Ted leaving his kid and moving to England. And, mm -hmm. and 
sort of the premise was because his wife said she wanted space. But he also got this job opportunity that took him all the way to England. And to me, that is, because they don't address that. And I'm fascinated by that mm -hmm. because if it had been a woman who had left her 10-year-old back in the United States to take a job, mm -hmm. even if it was because her husband said he needed space, that's what the entire show would be about. Shame. Mm -hmm. It would be about like, her leaving her kid yeah. for a mm -hmm. job. And like the plot line would be her having left right, her kid right. for a job. And this is barely a blip. And, and I guess I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about this, but I, I wonder what your, did you guys have any thoughts about that? Did you notice that? Or does that still speak to our expectations of men versus women when it comes to these, not, when it comes to career, when it comes to parenting? That's a really, really good question. And for whatever reason, so my, my own partner and I, we actually just finished watching Gilmore Girls, mm -hmm. which a whole part of one of the storylines in that is um, a mother leaves you know, the kid and her partner and goes and works in France or something like mm -hmm. that. And they paint her in such a negative light. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, in Ted Lasso, it's almost painted as like a positive thing. Oh, good for him for, mm -hmm. you know, giving his, you know, wife, you know, the space that she's asking for and good for him for pursuing this opportunity. Um, but we see later on that that is very clearly a decision that he struggles with. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, I haven't thought about that a whole lot. That makes a lot of sense that like they really don't address that in the slightest. Mm -hmm. right. It is interesting. Again, I like find myself kind of reflecting on my own life and I, my family, we moved around a whole lot growing mm -hmm. up. Um, and as far as I know, it was always because my dad would um, get promoted at a job and then go and find another job that would be higher paying, but that would require the family to move. Mm -hmm. So the family just kind of always followed him. And now I do find myself wondering like, my mom worked for about half of my childhood. What would have happened had she done the same mm -hmm. thing? I honestly don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I think when it comes to work, I still think we have, you know, quite a pretty gendered expectations that I don't <laughs> think this show. I would like this show to address more. Um, the other thing I wanted, to, one of the other things I wanted to ask, get your take on is. Um, since we are therapists, I was really fascinated by Ted's journey with therapy. Like mm -hmm. I think. In the beginning, I get the sense that he kind of blamed the, the therapist that he and his wife saw for the divorce. Like mm -hmm. he just, he had a very negative experience with it. Yeah. He said yeah. it felt like a setup. And then, you know, when they suggested he gets a therapist for the team, he was like, no, I really would rather not. I don't see the, you know, he didn't mm -hmm. want to. And then his own journey with therapy, I think really represents how a, a lot of men I know at least feel about therapy. Even men that I know who are, are mm -hmm. really open to the idea still get very uncomfortable when it comes to actually mm -hmm. going to therapy. Um, and I'm just wondering, I imagine you have some male clients um, and you're men yourselves. I, I'm just curious, mm -hmm. how, what were your thoughts about Ted's relationship with <laughs> therapy and, and how realistic is that? Like how often do you see that when, you know, if and when you work with men or even with your friends or people you talk to about therapy? Mm -hmm. Um, my own experience, my, my caseload even right now is probably about 50% men. Mm -hmm. And of those, about half of them, even though I've been working with them for at least six months, are mm -hmm. still kind of in this space where even just like saying, I feel, mm -hmm. and actually saying an emotion, not saying like, I feel this is whatever, yeah. um, it's still hard for them. Um, they prefer to say, I think. It's not even that they or prefer I to feel, say, but I then think, they say yeah. thought yeah. after it. <laughs> yeah, all the time. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I mean, it's a show. It's, it might be exaggerated a little bit, but I don't actually think it's too far mm. off in how a lot of men, at least, perceive therapy. And again, kind of that like opening up emotionally. Again, it's not something that we really know how to do. We're not taught. We don't have the language. It's scary. Mm -hmm. um, Misunderstood. Yep. I get the sense that a lot of men feel like therapy is threatening. I've even noticed that in my work with couples. Why do you think that mm -hmm. is? Why does therapy seem not just awkward or uncomfortable, but, but threatening? Um, I, I think it has a lot to do with like almost a sense of failure. Mm -hmm. 
that's kind of like what I pick up. Yeah. Is, you know, I have been taught to be this way, to act mm -hmm. this way. If I do this thing, life will work out for me. And mm -hmm. now suddenly, for whatever reason, I need some help. Therefore, I'm a failure. Right. So there's some shame with that. Yes. Of needing therapy, there's some sense of shame that comes with that. Yeah. Well, Maybe. it would also mean there's something wrong with you then mm -hmm. that you couldn't be fine with. Yeah. But I think it goes back to something that we've already talked about, that like, at least I, I think there's a part where if we are in fact asking some men to do something they have no comprehension how to do, then mm -hmm. there's a mm -hmm. fear attached to right. Mm -hmm. what it, it like there's just a lot of misconception mm -hmm. and then there's fear of something like if I most people who don't know how to do something we ask mm -hmm. them to right. do it right. I don't think that's necessarily just men I think mm -hmm. it's just humans yeah, yeah. it's like right. do you know how to fly a plane right no so if you tell so, me to fly a plane right how would you feel yeah like I'm gonna die yeah <laughs> <laughs> so interesting and which is maybe then why women are more comfortable going to therapy is because we've spent our whole lives talking about our feelings and so talking about it to a professional isn't doesn't feel like flying a plane mm -hmm. i almost feel like a lot of men would would be more confident flying a plane who'd never flown a plane before probably it's something more physical <laughs> i'll just watch a few youtube videos <laughs> yeah. and then i'll be fine but that might be like the false sense of confidence with yeah. confidence sure. like mm -hmm. i'll figure it out well, and, and I think too, there's the gender thing. Like men fly planes, so I'm a man, and therefore I can figure out how to fly a plane. Talking about my, you know, fears, my secrets, my insecurities. Like, mm, mm -hmm. nope. That's... But I wonder if there's a disconnect with that, where like you and I can say doing that, mm -hmm. I can tell you the benefit of doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure that all men could tell you the benefit that if you actually explore your feelings, your mm -hmm. thoughts, your emotions, right. the why behind the things right. that you mm -hmm. do, you would actually feel better. Right. You and I can explain that, but I don't know that that's a super widespread thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's, I mean, so there it is. As the show seems to be encouraging men to talk more about their feelings, talk more about their relationships, I guess the question is maybe Maybe what you're saying, Kyle, is we haven't made a very good case necessarily as to why that's good. Why is it good to be vulnerable in front of other people? Why is it good to say this, you know, I'm scared? Or why, does it, why is it good to cry? You know, mm -hmm. why are those things good? Why should men be watching the show and going, oh, maybe I should have some friends. Maybe I should allow myself to feel things. What comes from that? I think just what comes to my mind automatically is like, you'll feel a lot better about life when you have people that care about you around mm -hmm. you. When you care about them and they care about you, life is a lot easier. And that mm -hmm. requires like, being vulnerable, is that what you're saying? Like, yeah. You have to be able to talk about your feelings or be authentically yourself. Mm -hmm. I think something that com like, comes to mind is like, I have this group of guys that I play games with at night. Some of them live in Canada, a bunch are out east, and I talk to them five or six days a week. And I think the idea, like, I think when my wife first found out that I did that, she thought it was like, you guys are playing video games together, which is in fact true. But like, that group of guys, everyone talks about mm -hmm. everything that comes mm -hmm. up. No. Sometimes it's just having fun, but like, I could call anyone in that group and tell them mm -hmm. anything and they will do the same. And I think that's the thing where it's like, that feels good. Mm -hmm. There's a, a network of that where like, that just makes life a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that's the case we could make that is better. Yeah. Like the diamond dogs, but they feel a lot better when they connect with each other. It also points mm -hmm. to how, I mean, there aren't a lot of women I know who connect with their female friends as they're playing video games. They just get together with their friends. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of guys, all different ages, who their connection with friends is through doing things. It's mm -hmm. going to shows, it's going to yep. sports events, it's going, yeah. it's playing mm -hmm. video games. And they do talk about stuff, but they, I rarely, I don't know a lot of men who are like, yeah, I'm just gonna get together with mm -hmm. my guy friends and we're just gonna like right. talk. I think it's we get together for dinner and chat. Right. <laughs> I, I think that like whole idea of like doing things, it's it's almost like a fidget, where yeah. it allows you to distract yourself just enough yeah. that you can kind of bring down your walls. You can be a little mm -hmm. bit more vulnerable. Um, I'm in the the same boat yeah. that Kyle's in. 
Um, and the same sort of thing where like I can go to any of them and I have and they've come to me. Yeah. Um, I was going somewhere with that thought and then it just like flew away. Oh, okay. um, but like the, the school of thought that both Kyle yeah. and I come from, uh, there's a heavy emphasis on what happens when you are able to build community and be yeah. a part mm -hmm. of community and have that community identity and whatnot. Um, and I think that by being vulnerable and being authentic, you are able to actually have that sense of connection. And I do think that points to, I was just thinking about that scene where Sam gets his hair cut mm. and all the guys are around, it's like this ritual kind mm -hmm. of thing which women also wouldn't do. And it, it occurred to me that maybe what's important about this show is it's showing that men need to connect with other men and it's not, it doesn't have to look like the way women connect with other women. We mm -hmm. don't have to say, look guys, if you're gonna learn how to be in touch with your feelings yeah. like women are, yeah. it needs to look like the way we do it and mm -hmm. here's how we do it. But I think, I, I like this idea that just cause it's through video, you know, just cause you do a lot mm -hmm. of your talking through video games, that the, somehow that, I mean, that's not less than, right? That, right? that doesn't make it. But I think there is a little bit of a, like, maybe it's just me, but like, there's a bit of a view where like, that maybe is diminished with that then. And like, mm. I yeah. find it wonderful, like, playing that's a video what I'm game. Like, or, I don't like, think it has to be. Yeah. And like, I think mm -hmm. there's maybe a tendency by some women to diminish that. Like, why do you need a video game to talk mm -hmm. to your yeah. friends? Why not just talk to your friends? I have a best friend that like, we build stuff, mm -hmm. like do a ton of woodworking. And one of my mentors, she always makes the joke and she's like, oh, you're solving the world's problems then. <laughs> like, you know, like whatever is going on, no matter if it's a really good week or a really bad week, we'll go to the workshop, mm -hmm. build stuff. And it doesn't necessarily even mean that we talk about everything. Mm -hmm. It just means you're in community with that person. And like, there is something about that that feels really cathartic. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I agree with you that there is something about like, it can look different mm -hmm. and probably it maybe needs to. Mm -hmm. It maybe needs to, and maybe that's okay. I mean, the best yeah. conversations mm -hmm. I had with my dad were when we were building something together or fishing. Mm -hmm. Like that's when my dad would talk mm -hmm. is when mm -hmm. we were doing something like that. That doesn't make it less good than if we were just sitting in the kitchen mm -hmm. yeah. chatting. And so All right. I think the, the bridge that we can build is not so much like that's less good, but encouragement, like you don't need to always right. be doing something to be able to yeah. be vulnerable. Right, right, that it's not, exactly, you don't have to be reliant or dependent on that, right. but that maybe this is how men are gonna, maybe this is the way that it just makes the most sense for guys to, mm -hmm. to, to talk and, and connect is through an activity like sports or video games mm -hmm. or fishing or whatever. So I like, I like that idea and I loved, I loved that scene when Sam was getting his hair cut because <laughs> I just, I loved that it, just all those times when the team really came together and connected emotionally, it wasn't about sports, it was about them supporting each other. Those mm -hmm. were my favorite moments. Yeah. You know, when Sam, you know, uh, boycotts Dubai Air mm -hmm. and the team comes together and supports him and I, just, I, I want more of that for the men in my life. I want them to have more of that that sense of camaraderie and that someone has your back and it's not just your female partner. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Or your mom, you know, like that, yeah. there, <laughs> that there are like, other men who can yeah. have your, yeah. you know, that you can connect with and go to when you, when you need that. Mm -hmm. I want to spend a little time talking about Nate. I know mm -hmm. he's probably nobody's favorite character, but I also think he's a really important one mm -hmm. to talk about when we're talking about masculinity. Because Nate starts out in the show and he's the, you know, the overlooked invisible one, you know, yeah. oh, you mean me, Nate, you know, and looking behind him and, you know, like, how could I, I'm, I'm invisible. And his identity has become this invisible person. And then as he starts to get seen, we see him not knowing what to do with that, liking it, liking that being seen, mm -hmm. wanting to then be something more than invisible, but having nobody there to really give him any guidance on what that means to be more, I don't, I don't want to use the word masculine, but I feel like that's what he's trying to do. He's trying mm -hmm. to be 
more alpha or something. He's trying to be important. He's yeah. trying to be important. He's trying to be like the guys around him who he sees getting all this attention and getting the groupies and, you know, mm -hmm. getting the press mentions and being accepted and, and adored and admired. And he wants that so badly. And he sees the opportunity to go there, but no matter what he does, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but he's trying it in these very stereotyped alpha male way toxic male ways really mm -hmm. and i just was wondering like when you watched nate go through this there have been lots of articles online and a lot of discussions on on facebook about like what happened to nate and what's that about and i just wanted to get your take because there are a lot of different ways of understanding nate but i think they all involve male identity it's almost like he didn't know what to do once yeah. he got power mm -hmm. And then he tried doing certain things that he's seen other people in yeah. his life do, including like his own dad, which mm -hmm. that is a whole relationship. Um, so he starts doing these things and they're not exactly the healthiest things, but they end up working for mm -hmm. him. Right, right. Ex insult, you know, giving some kind of insulting mm -hmm. feedback to the players. Right. Well, but think and about how we just talked about jobs though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, on, there is a view, I don't think it's like, that was not, I wouldn't argue that was the right way to go about it, but he did get the job he wanted. Mm -hmm. That's like what I'm he, saying, yeah. it's like, these behaviors that they're working for. Yeah, he, I mean, like, he got, ultimately, yeah. in like, just a strict sense of the thing, like, he's now very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it just it breaks my heart because I feel like he he could have gone in so many directions had he had even Ted. I feel like Ted totally let him down. I feel like if someone just said, "Let's let's get like you're yeah. coming into your own. Yeah. Let's talk about how to do that in a way that's going to work for you mm -hmm. and get you what you want. Get you know help you get relationships with you know if you want a girlfriend, let's talk about <laughs> right. how to do that in a healthy way. If you want to be, you know, move up in coaching, let's mm -hmm. talk about that. But instead, he was just kind of left to flounder. Nobody was taking him seriously. It's yeah. all he mm -hmm. had were these kind of caricatures of powerful men, yeah. which is why he ended up with Rupert, right? Like mm -hmm. caricature yeah. of, a, of a powerful man in the unhealthiest version. Mm -hmm. And as I just, when I watched it through the second time, I could see how they developed that arc from the very beginning. I thought, oh, so many opportunities yeah, for right. someone to have stopped this and helped mm -hmm. him, that poor guy. Well, it's like the old buddy, like uh, you yeah. don't actually have to go about this this way. Right. Yeah. It's completely unnecessary. Like, I mean, I think the heartbreaking part is he actually was important, he just didn't yeah. realize it. Mm -hmm. And he was smart and competent and had all those skills and mm -hmm. he didn't have anyone to say, you do have it. Let's, mm -hmm. all you need is to believe in yourself right. and let's talk about it, you know. Yeah, I mean, if you look at his story arc, yeah. he has been emotionally kind of beaten down mm -hmm. what seems like his entire life. Yeah. So, yeah, what do you do when you finally find this space where you see self-confidence and you see potential, but you're not getting validation from, like, anyone else? Yeah, what, mm -hmm. what do you do with that? Kind of reminds me of the stereotype of that, like, tech startup guy who's, like, the nerd in high school and mm -hmm. then becomes this billionaire, and now he just treats everyone else like shit because... Mm -hmm. That's how he was treated, and now he's got the power, yeah. and so, like, I'm That's gonna... a really good analogy. Yeah, that is. Because I think that's the whole thing that I think about him when I, like, watch the show is, like, he doesn't know what to do with what he has. Mm -hmm. And so he's just going to treat other people the way he was treated. Yep. That's what he knows. That's what he knows. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, um, as mm -hmm. I'm aware of our need to wrap up for the... Uh, first, thank you. This has been... <laughs> I wish we... I always wish we had more time to talk it, right. about this stuff. <laughs> But uh, the question I'm asking everybody at the end of each episode are, is what shows are you watching right mm -hmm. now that you're excited about, um, th that your therapist self is excited about, that you watch mm -hmm. and you're thinking about, like kind of engages that therapist part of you? I am going to get on my high horse and uh, reiterate The Last of Us. It is a, a zombie show where the zombies are just the background. It is all about grief and loss and what do you do when you don't find meaning or have meaning and it's heartbreaking and wonderful okay all the existential stuff all of it excellent that is next on my list cool. so this weekend kyle anything that you've been watching um i started re-watching true detective season one <laughs> okay which is like 
kind of overly intense, but like I actually do find the two of them together. Like there's something that is really comforting about the two of them who are radically different men. Hmm. But like there's something about that relationship in which both of them were better. Like, yeah, kind of a dark yeah, I don't thing. Know, I don't know much at all about that show, so I'll have to check that out. Season one, I, I think it's one of the most remarkable seasons of any show I've ever seen. And there's wow. like, it's, right. there's something about their relationship and it's about doing things and like, you know, being like, I don't know. it, But like, they end up touching on all of the emotions that they're both going through. And the ending, I think, is just one of the best endings of any show I've ever seen. Cool. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's a that's compelling. I'm going to yeah. check it out now. <laughs> well, I want to thank you both for coming on again. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, let me know if you ever want to come back on again. Yeah, this was fun. All right. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. This episode of When Therapists Watch TV was produced by Ellie Mental Health. Miranda Barker is the managing producer. Jesse Stenbroughton is the technical director. Our production team also includes Julia Galloway, Lucas Mooney, and Two Fam. A special thanks to Lucas Fellini, Nick Seeger, and Mel Springer. I'm Dr. Terry Bly. Thanks for listening.